London, the banks of the River Thames. It's the third week in May and the grounds of the Royal Hospital Chelsea have been transformed as they have been since 1913 into a breathtaking, sweet-smelling, almost unbelievable inspiration for gardeners who come here from all over the world. Welcome to the Royal Horticultural Society's 75th Chelsea Flower Show. in preparation this gigantic seed packet of landscapers and designers, nurserymen, florists and gardeners finally springs to life with all the brilliance of a floral firework. But it's not been an easy year. This has been one of the latest springs on record. Last weekend southerly gales lashed the plants just as exhibitors were trying to put the finishing touches to months of hard work. This is the place to launch new varieties and new growing techniques. It's also the place where designers can really make their name. After 10 years in banking, I realised I was a lot more passionate about plants than I ever was about checkbooks. Many of the designers of gardens here are young. Andrew Fisher Tomlin of Ascombe Bryan College in York has designed this globe trotter's garden for a seasoned traveller who's been going round the globe and bringing back plants for his garden, sort of 15 years with a sponge bag full of cuttings. But what makes a banker decide to become a gardener? Well, banking's very boring compared to all this, and I can build all the gardens I ever wanted and get paid for it at the same time. What sort of plants are in this globe trotter's garden? Well, I've got hot, jazzy sections, and I've also got cool, lush, green sections, so overall it's very calming on the eye. And I've also mixed in a lot of stonework and ironwork into the overall scheme. And what ironwork it is, designed by Stephen Lunn of Morpeth in Northumberland, pea pods of stone and steel, that cry out to be caressed. Dan Pearson has designed a rooftop garden for the Evening Standard. Dan, it seems to me that this garden is, is practical and it's possible, unlike a lot of the dream gardens we're kind of used to seeing here at Chelsea. Is that fair? Definitely. I wanted to show the potential of um, roof gardening. Um, and to do that, I think you need to use things which are really going to work in those situations of high wind and lots of light. It's, it's, it's a very unusual environment, it's like almost being by the sea. So we've got these big solid shapes which echo the architecture, the big to domes of Tyne and Santalina, and then the things which move in amongst them. So there's this, this constant uh, change in the planting. I love the thrift, the armeria there with that blue fescue grass. Yeah. It's the most wonderful idea to copy that. I shall well, do that. It's using <laughs> things that grow by the sea and things which are already um, adapted for these situations. So what would you say in a nutshell was your style? Um, garden design is a very personal thing. It's almost like dressing somebody, you know, it's that personal. Um, and you put in your skill and try and draw out what they want and then hopefully mesh with something which will be the garden. If you don't have them involved in that process, they'll never be involved in the garden in the way that they shouldn't. It won't develop a spirit of its own. I'm young, enthusiastic, I think I'm talented, and I've never actually had a garden design course in my life, but horticulture is what I really love. Plants, that's what it's all about. At 27, Fiona Lawrenson is the youngest garden designer here. For British Sky Broadcasting, she's put together a New England cottage garden of the kind you might find at Rhode Island. What I love about the New England cottage gardens is the energy with the plants. They put every possible colour together, every variety. They cram annuals in every available space. The box isn't clipped. No, that's a variety called Boxer's Green Velvet and it's incredibly hardy. They don't topiarise the same as the English or the uh, French do. They pinch it out so you get a much looser effect. That peony is rather special. That's an American hybrid called Buckeye Bell. And I placed her there with the longer florums behind to give a very serene feel to the garden in that corner. 
and I think my favourite plant is this little one down here, yeah. a red flowered broad bean, one of the old cottagers broad beans, just ordinary saved seeds with those lovely rosy red flowers. East meets west on John Van Haag's Japanese artist's garden. I haven't quite placed my stones facing east. The idea behind this garden is a free, informal feel with a Japanese flavour to it, very much with a cultural exchange thing in mind. We've got Japanese lanterns that are 100 years old, were imported in 1907. Um, and then we've got an English sculptress who's um, designed this sun sculpture. And then it goes, reflects back into the paintings, which are Japanese. We had an artist over from Japan last week to paint these. I love the pine tree. It's fab, isn't it? It's one of my favourite plants in the whole garden. It's actually about 80 years old and worth £8,000, but I've only borrowed it. I think it matches beautifully in with the grasses, which aren't Japanese varieties, but I think together the whole scheme really works well. Stephen Woodhams is the young designer responsible for Sally Clark's kitchen garden for You Magazine and Yardley. If only I could see it. Now that's clever. Aluminium furniture, hard grey brick edging, shiny galvanised containers and a fruitcage that looks like a space rocket. Stephen Woodhams, what do you think you're playing at? Well, um, I've always loved kitchen gardens and Sally Clark's got a great restaurant in Kensington and I thought it'd be great to base a garden around her philosophy on cooking and hence we've gone with a really strong planting scheme, it's blue and orange. Um, and it's de designed very much like a Victorian potager. It's, it's very strong, it's contemporary. We've put willow weave next to steel. It's very bright, it's very strong. Galvanised posts, steel cabling, um, but yet planting, which is similar to uh, as in a formal potager. So do garden designers like eating? Uh, well, uh, give me some, we've got some lovely rocket over there. Give me some rocket parmesan shavings and a bit of balsamic vinegar on anybody's. It might make you smile, or it might make your day, but one thing this orchestra will most certainly not be making is music. This extraordinary topiary scene shows you just what can happen when your local parks department runs amok. This one's from Torbay Borough Council, and it's nestling right next to an exotic display from the East Caribbean. Quite a geographical mishmash, but then that's the big marquee. International friendships are formed here and renewed year after year. Petty rivalries bloom along with the flowers. Exhibitors exhaust themselves, tickling, trimming and tidying to perfection. From the colleges and clubs who want to tell you something to the nurseries who want to sell you something, everyone's vying for your attention. The Eric Young Orchid Foundation is a charity devoted to growing new varieties of orchid and persuading us to grow them. This absolutely stunning display of Miltonias, probably the finest in the world, is something that you too can grow at home. The secret is to give them weak feeds throughout the summer. Then when you water them, don't be mealy-mouthed about it. Really drench them. But the golden rule with orchids is don't do that too often, so don't cause overwatering. The result is this. The backbone of the horticultural industry and the marquee is the family business. Medwin Williams is a specialist in vegetable seeds like his father before him. It's not a business really, it's just a hobby that's gone out of control. But really it's just the wife, myself, and I get a lot of help off my father. I like the look of your blue potatoes, tell me about those. Well, the blue potatoes have attracted a lot of attention, and they did last year at Hampton Court as well. They're quite unusual in the fact that there's a lot of blue potatoes, but there's not many blue potatoes that stay blue when they're cooked, and these do that. Quite a, a, a nice dish for a dinner party. What about your bullseye beetroot? Well, yes, that's the chogia pink. Um, a beautiful uh, a beetroot for a display, but when you cut it, it's like a dartboard. It's got red and white rings alternately. It may not taste so nice, but David Austin's new rose looks and smells delightful. It's called Septed Isle, and the recipient of the first posy is the Queen. Well, my father's the main man. He's the rose breeder, creates all these wonderful roses. I'm the managing director and run the company, the day-to-day -day running of the company. My sister's also involved. She's an iris, peony, and daylily specialist, as well as herbaceous plants. My brother does all the computer programming for the office staff. My mother, she does the sculptures, and my wife runs the tea shop. 
This year, the Austin family roses are looking their best. Their shrub roses have responded better to light treatment, necessary pre-show this year because of the cold weather, than have hybrid teas. Mark Roberts from Bouts Cottage Nurseries has a new viola. Our newer viola is Ross Castle Black, which is the most amazing viola, truly a perennial and very long living. But this family business started 18 years ago when our family company, which was in engineering, was taken over. And I could see the writing on the wall. And so I went and qualified at Pershaw Horticultural College and we're absolutely flat out. Looks as though it's been here forever, doesn't it? But would you believe that for 48 weeks of the year, this patch of ground is football pitches and tennis courts. It's transformed in just three weeks with something amounting to military precision. The day before the show opens and Gordon Ray, the Royal Horticultural Society's Director General, casts an eagle eye over the exhibits in the marquee. So how do these exhibitors win a place here? Well, they all make applications. There are many, many more applications for sites than we have actually got sites. And so we then have to choose. And the choice is made, Alan, as a result of their track record. And their track record has been exhibitions or exhibits at other places. It can be the NEC at Birmingham, it could be Malvern, at the Westminster shows. All of these are shows where we are able to see these exhibitors and the plans that they have got before they actually apply to exhibit here. Now, people don't have to pay to exhibit here, do they? No, they don't. They don't pay in the Grand Marquis and they don't pay for the garden sites outside. It's just the sundries people here to sell that pay. They do, yes. Now, all these exhibitors are coming for that coveted gold medal. And you see walking around these groups of judges, very serious looking people. Who are they? Well, they are a group of people who have been brought together over the years for one reason, and that's because of their experience, their knowledge and their experience of their particular field. What are they looking for? In a word, excellence. They're looking for quality of plants, quality of presentation, artistry, all of these things are important in each and every of the exhibits, the one of the exhibits that you see here. number of gold medals? No, there are not. Winning a gold medal is about reaching a certain standard in the various aspects that judges are looking for in each and every one of the exhibits. So if every single one fulfilled all of the criteria, you could theoretically have every stand with a gold medal. Now, that'll be the day, wouldn't it? It really would. <laughs> as well as being a place of horticultural excellence, I mean, Chelsea is also a great social occasion. It is. How much of that do you think is due to royal patronage? In part, I think it is. The society is very honoured to have two patrons, both the Queen and the Queen Mother. And of course, other members of the royal family, such as the Prince of Wales, are extraordinarily interested in gardening. If it's pouring with rain, yeah. you probably want to take the Queen straight into the marquee. Yeah. Yeah. I think all this is marvellous, don't you? I mean, they're really fantastic, by the way. And this is fun. It's really good. So we must bring the Queen, so bring the queen. I think we can bring the Queen through. See, 
do seem to enjoy themselves when they come along around here. I think they do. It's a great occasion on Monday evening when all the members of the royal family do in fact come and they are escorted around the whole of this site here. Yes. You really can rub shoulders with royalty. Well, you can, yes. What makes Chelsea the best flower show in the world? Because there is nowhere else in the world, there is no other flower show where everything like this is brought together. You have the best of British horticulture, you have the best of exhibits that have been brought from overseas, the widest variety of plants that you could possibly wish for. This is the centrepiece of floral artistry throughout the whole of the world, brought in one place for four days. Here, this is how it goes. Monday is royalty and press day. Tuesday and Wednesday, it's open only to members of the Royal Horticultural Society. And Thursday and Friday is when it's open to the general public. Surprisingly, getting a ticket isn't as difficult or as pricey as you'd think. This is my first time. Now, where on earth do I begin? With 24 different gardens to enjoy and over 200 exhibits in the marquee, there's an awful lot to see. I'm going to need a little help. There she blows! The marquee is in the Guinness Book of Records as the biggest of its type in the world. It has to be put up by tall ship riggers. I just can't get over all the different colours here and the fantastic scent. Oh, delicious. Bliss. Want some? Outside the marquee, the variety is blowing my mind. There are gardens to satisfy every fantasy, from the most grand conservatory to the most humble of greenhouses. Not to mention arbors and arches galore. There's an Alice in Wonderland feel to the scale of things here. There are thousands of different pots, from this size to this size. This is my idea of a proper bonsai. But this one's a mutant! This tiny alpine flower from China is the smallest one I've found. It's so rare, it hasn't even been named yet. Maybe they could name it after me. On the other hand, maybe I'd rather put my name to begonias as huge and fluffy as these. Or delphiniums as tall and elegant as these. Not only is this like Paddington Station, it's also one of the longest avenues I've ever seen. And I'm feeling completely spoiled for choice by all the strange and wonderful accessories on sale. There must be a more effective way. I've found it, my dream mower. Corporate hospitality here is really exclusive and even I couldn't blag my way in. But even out here you can still get everything from oysters and champagne to beer and chips. I've had such a great time here, it's been a real treat and I'd recommend it to anybody. Cheers. Vita Sackville West is one of the best known and most influential names in garden design. Her masterpiece, Sissinghurst Castle, is much visited and widely imitated, especially the famous White Garden. Here, Mark Walker, for his sponsors Cartier and Harpers and Queen, has borrowed both her name and her style. His Sackville West Garden is exemplary, a rigid structure within which there is profusion and informality. Strong colour combinations complementing the mellow brick of the walls.
an informal spring nuttery. It's lovely, but Rita Sackville West was working in the first half of this century. I wonder why the sponsors have chosen to resurrect her in 1996. I think that Chelsea should be a forum for new ideas. However, Julian Dowell and Jackie Gordon clearly don't agree with me. For their sponsors, Preferred Direct Insurance, they've created the perfect 1930s garden using 1930s accessories. Here's Dan Pearson's design again, and thank heavens for it. His evening standard garden also has its roots in the 1930s. Much influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright and the modernist movement, the exciting end-of-the-century roof garden dares to blur its boundaries with glass. Peter Stiles is another designer who takes the past into the future. He's looked still further back for his inspiration, right back to the ancient Celts, in fact. He's used dark slate, deep-coloured planting, craggy, mysterious shapes, and lines that swirl like water. Sponsors Borderstone and Dingle Nurseries must be pleased with the original, arresting and very up-to-date result. The Japanese were building gardens while we over here were still scrabbling around in the dirt. But somehow it's the very simplicity of their work which makes it seem so modern. Hiroshi Nanamori and Andrew Butcher for COA have resisted the urge so many designers feel to fill every inch of space. They built a garden of contemplation, where nature is represented, but not slavishly reproduced. is an oasis of tranquility in the mad bustle that is Chelsea. This arch of bright laburnum hasn't quite reached its peak and that's the skill of exhibiting at Chelsea to bring each bloom to the point of perfection in show week. It's never easy and this year it's been tough. With one week to go, Alan visited two nurseries in Suffolk to see if they'd make it. A flowering cherry tree, Prunus Shirofugan. It can flower any time between the 1st and the 31st of May. But this year, it has to be at the peak of perfection on Monday the 20th. That's when the Queen comes to Chelsea. This year, it's been a particular challenge. I'd say it's been the coldest, driest, latest spring that we've had for well, at least 15 years, probably even longer. Does that make you just a mite nervous? Whenever Chelsea is, it's always a panic, but we prepare three times the plants that we need for the exhibit. A third won't be out, a third will be right, a third will be over. So what are the different regimes you Well, need? that's a matter of the skill and use of cold store, greenhouse and shade house the right way to hold plants back or force them as is necessary. Laburnum. To make you sigh, it should have long yellow flower trails. Instead, what have you got? Green caterpillars. Needs a bit of heat. Oh. 
But if stuff starts to move too fast and comes out too quickly, there's a danger it'll go over before the show, like this flowering crab. So what they do is bring it into a moist cold store, fractionally above freezing. But you've got to wait until the first flowers are open. Otherwise, these plants get bud drop. That's exactly what's going to happen to me if I stay in here a moment longer. Now, your job's on the line here, Fred. Yeah. You've got to get them there in flower <laughs> and looking good. How many years have you been doing it? Well, during the show work, I've been, well, I've been with the company about 44 years, but I've been in the show work about the last 30 years. And are you quietly confident? Well, I'm pretty confident, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the cherries in the natural state at the moment have gone over. Oh, yes. Well, we coal saw these trees early January, and then uh, they're in there, and we bring them out. So this one came out about five weeks ago. Stood outside in the in our cold east wind. <laughs> didn't just, move at didn't all. Move, didn't move at all. And I had to bring it in, my decision to bring it in about oh, a week ago, this one. Hopefully I can get it right for next week. Well, your cherries, Fred, have been in cold store and now brought into the heat to bring them on. What about this laburnum here that's in the greenhouse? Well, this came in about a week ago. This, uh, just to help it out a bit more, they were very, very tight. And I thought, well, uh, they're not going to make it without some bit of help in the greenhouse. So uh, hopefully week's time, that should be just spot on. But this has just been outside, there's yeah. no cold store treatment oh, no, for this? no, 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 just a natural, this one. So with any luck, this time next week, these yellow flowers will be dripping down through a tunnel of laburnum blooms. Oh, yes, yes, I think they'll be, I think they'll be, I'm pretty confident they'll be out. <laughs> yeah. Glad you're confident. <laughs> Notcuts have a chain of garden centres across the country, and they go to Chelsea to promote brand awareness. Dennis Baker, has one nursery. It's just down the road from Knock Cuts, where he started his apprenticeship. This is Home Meadows Nursery, and he goes to Chelsea Flower Show to sell his seeds. He's 80 now, but as well as being known for Korean chrysanthemums and gladioli, the seeds people want to buy are of these. Iceland poppies. <laughs> This year, it's been about the hardest and the most difficult year we've had for about oh, seven or eight years at least. Everything's either been late or too cold, too windy, too dry. So that everything really for Chelsea and everything else is about at least three, three weeks late, late. And yet, it still looks beautiful. Well, yes, but then this is our insurance. The ice and poppies in the Polythene tunnels are an insurance against the very sort of year that we're having. Because the ones that we've got in the field which should be in flower are only just beginning to flower. At what stage do you cut them then, Dennis? Well, we always cut them when the bud is either upright or practically upright. It grows bent over like a shepherd's crook. The day before it opens, it straightens like that. We cut them like that always. They last for about seven days in water, but only if you give them what we call the hot water treatment. That is, you dip the end of the stem in boiling water for a few seconds, the bottom end, of course, <laughs> <laughs> and then straight into cold water and it drives the air out of the stem and we normally cut them in the evening. Last year we had between four and five thousand. This year with the weather we shall have between two and three thousand. But uh, we can still make an exhibit of them. <laughs> Dennis Baker will be pleased to know that there's a definite turning away from pale pastels this year to brilliant colours. Trisha Guild is an interior designer and passionate gardener who freely admits that her use of colours indoors is very much influenced by a love of colours in nature. Coming from the world of textiles and interior design, I tend to think of the gardens as another room, a space to be designed and then filled with magical ingredients. So we're going to explore the wonderful inspiration of colour. Green, balanced and harmonious, energized as spring, and vital as green pastures covered with morning dew. Green flowers are sometimes overlooked, but the fragile, beautiful quality of Alcamilla mollis and the rare auriculas that the Victorians were passionate about are just so special. White, the ancient symbol of chastity and purity, 
serene, calming, glistening like pearls. From damask roses to viburnum and the purity of arum lilies. The delight of yellow, fresh, warm, full of sunlight, always positive and embracing. From the cool lime yellows of spring daffodils to the deep, rich, papery gold quality of poppies. Orange, fiery earth colours, rich saffron spices, autumn leaves, summer sunsets. Begonias and iridescent sparkling zinnias. Shades of red, from scarlet to crimson, ruby and vermilion. A hot, passionate colour, full of romance and of rage. Always assertive and vigorous in the garden. Shades of pink, the deep, rich magenta, luxurious and so exotic. And the more delicate, feminine and fragile tones pale damask roses and their heavenly mixtures of peonies with their first blush of pink. Blue, the most heavenly of colours and perhaps my very favourite, both indoors and outdoors. Calm, strong and spiritual, reminding me of that pure Mediterranean sky or of the cool icy water. Purple, full of grace and elegance, majestic, regal and powerful to use. Stately alliums, almost black tulips and the wonderful blooms of clematis. Choosing colour is a very exciting process. It's also highly personal. And I suggest if it's inspiration you're looking for, then this is the place to come. Chelsea Flower Show is a bit of a celebrity magnet. On press day five years ago, there were only a couple of famous faces, but this year there are 61 of them. It's a bit like rent a face to sell your flower or your garden. And I am in Star Spotter's heaven. Are you on your best behaviour? Yeah, well, so far, yeah, I haven't had a chance to misbehave yet. I've only been here 10 minutes. I'm here because of this new fuchsia. It's been called Bobby's Girl, apparently after me. And are you pleased? Yeah, it's absolutely thrilling to have something named after you, and it's so pretty as well. I'm clutching them avidly to my bosom now. This is the Leslie Joseph. It's so exciting. What does it feel like to have a flower named after oh, you? Betty Booth, Roy and Mila, what can I say? It's frilly, fragrant, and fabulously feminine. It's like a wonderful some of the, bloom. Some of your colleagues. That well, I'm not like. commenting on my colleagues. <laughs> it's lovely to have an hour here this morning. Do you intend to misbehave? Well, it depends. Well, what are you up to later? <laughs> yeah, don't uh, laugh. <laughs> don't laugh. Be afraid. Be <laughs> very afraid. <laughs> we're here because we're patrons of Help the Aged, and um, I worked for them last year. And we're also uh, king gardeners. Well, Michael's the king gardener, and I'm the person who sits in it. Do you like this garden? Oh, I think it's lovely. It's lovely. And particularly for people uh, enjoying early retirement now. Um, and so this gazebo has been built so that you can paint or sit or whatever. It's very lovely. It's Sally Clark's kitchen garden. And um, it's um, it, it, apparently everything is edible in here. Is that for real? Yeah. You're not just having a... No, it's nice. I'm going to wait for the taste. Fantastic. And have you seen any of the rest of the show yet? No, but I'm going to. With my sister. My sister is here and we're going to have a walk around. It's wonderful. I'm, I'm not in the tent this year. You're not yet in bloom. No, I'm not yet in bloom, but I'm very long laster, apparently, which is always comforting. <laughs> Prue is the gardener, not me, really. Um, I love gardens and, and I do donkey work under instruction. When we were first married, he got terribly cross when he planted something and it didn't come up next day. But he's getting really, really interested in it now, and so it's, it's, um, it's a sort of lovely shared interest. Oh, yeah. It's a lovely thing. It's very exciting what? to be here, Chelsea. It's the first um, time for me. The awful thing is, when you come to Chelsea Flower Show, you go home and you never garden again, because you can't, you can't compete with this. 
I try. I've never been here before, uh, and I haven't had a look round yet. I'm sure there's a beer tent somewhere. Where are we going this evening? We're going to the Chelsea Flat Show Royal Gala. How much were the tickets? Um, £170 pounds each. It's all right, they raise a million pounds for charity, so it's fine. Do you think there'll be many people there? Only about 4,000, which isn't a lot for there. It means you've got loads of room to see everything really close to. Alan, if I should meet a wealthy lord tonight, you will make yourself scarce, won't you? Play your cards right tonight. You could meet a prince. It's a royal gala. Drink up. People are wandering about here, drifting past the arrangements in an atmosphere of well-mannered refinement. It's quite delightful. Keen Gardeners here are armed with this, a catalogue, and this, a pen. We're on the prowl looking for good new plants, like this one, the Rose Magic Carpet, Rose of the Year for 1996. And last year, this was the best-selling rose in the United States. It's got the three attributes you look for in any rose. Good scent, long flowering season, and disease-resistant foliage. Write down, ground cover rose, magic carpet. In springs like this one, you're grateful for foliage as well as flowers. This is a brand new hardy deciduous shrub called Physocarpus diabolo. And for those who say I'm never critical of plants at Chelsea, I think this one is the colour of mud. Dreadful. The devil of a plant. But hostas are foliage plants that are deservedly popular. There are hundreds of new ones now coming at us left, right and centre from the United States and from Japan. Far too many. We don't need them all. But ones like this, which are distinctive, are worthwhile. Big boy, with leaves more than a foot across. Mind you, the slugs and snails will love it. You need to control the slugs and the snails in February, when the leaves are coming up and the slugs are coming out. Goldbrook plants can also offer you the most petite hosta. Tiny tears with leaves not much bigger than your thumbnail. And if we're talking petite, how about this? The first miniature yellow African violet, or St Paulia, bred in Britain. A sport from a white variety. This is Chanter Spring, raised in Norfolk. Fit a lot of them on your windowsill. Lewisias, like these Lewisia cotyledon hybrids from Ashwood Nurseries in the West Midlands, show just what plant breeders can achieve with this shade-loving alpine from Western North America. But the real find here are the Lewisia Ashwood Carousel hybrids, brilliant for sink gardens and tough as old boots but then one of its parents comes from the mountains of Yosemite National Park where it can take the winter moisture that other Lewisias hate. And so to the English cottage garden and on the stand of Botanic Nursery a brand new foxglove that's reliably perennial. Digitalis glory of roundway, a hybrid between Digitalis lutea and Digitalis mertonensis with tall, tapering spires of pale apricot flowers. This makes great clumps that you can divide up. A good garden plant, and so is this, a shrub. A honeysuckle, Lanicera coral coei, with downy grey-green foliage and masses of pale pink flowers from April until June. Grows to a height of about eight feet. You need a bit of space, but I reckon a good garden shrub. I'm in heaven. I'm here at Chelsea. I love anything to do with gardens and gardening, and I'm allowed to show you some of my particular favorites. Outside, there's plenty to see, of course. There's this exquisite pottery and garden ornaments and furniture. But for me, the real place to be is inside the marquee. The marquee is really magical, with all the wonderful colors and the scents 
and these stands, which have been put together in a matter of weeks, you'd think they'd been growing for ages. I have enormous respect for trees. In fact, I want to hug them all. This, you know, is actually an oak. Where would we gardeners be without them? But of course, although this is the most amazing display, the colors are quite stunning, aren't they? One that really comes to the Grand Marquis to see the plants and the flowers. Now, this stand is by Birmingham City Council. Isn't it amazing? I'm told there are over 70,000 plants here, quite a few of which we could actually grow in our own gardens because there's hydrangeas and tobacco plants and busy lizzies. Here's one you can't. It certainly doesn't come from Birmingham. In fact, it comes from Sumatra, and it needs very, very special conditions. But over here are the fastest plants in the show. The pride of Birmingham a Jaguar XJ220. There are 10,000 plants in here alone. It's the sort of car I really approve of, truly eco-friendly. Now, here are some of my absolute favorite sweet peas. Aren't they the most wonderful flower? I think because they only last for such a short time, one really appreciates them. They are so beautiful. But you see, they don't smell like they used to. They're now bred to look magnificent, be resistant to disease and all sorts of things, but the smell isn't there anymore. But I did find someone who told me that things were likely to get better. Well, people are always saying sweet peas are losing their perfume, but uh, my husband raises lots of new in varieties, and I always make sure that they're very heavily perfumed, the new ones he introduces. And people should remember that the older they get, they begin to lose their senses, and sense of smell is one of them. Come to Chelsea and learn the truth. I'm getting on. Oh, I don't know. That's rosemary and I can still smell it. Things are looking up. Now to really exercise your sense of smell, no matter what age you are, go for the lily stand. It really can knock you out. Aren't they beautiful? This is the stand for Trinidad and Tobago. The ladies set off the week before the show with their flowers. I don't know who's suffering more from the weather, the flowers or the ladies, but I think they'd get my gold medal. Here's another of my most favorite things, the Penelope Keith Rose. It was named after me a few years ago. Very proud I was. In the catalogue, she's called a sturdy little grower. In the empire of the senses, you're the queen of all you suffer. A tropical paradise designed by Bunny Guinness for Wyvale Garden Centers. And you really do feel as though you're sitting in the jungle underneath your straw hut by a waterfall amid all these plants. But there's one plant here that I don't think has ever been seen at Chelsea before. Xantheria, commonly known as black boys. When Captain Cook landed in Australia, he saw hundreds of these on the shore and he thought they were natives with spears. They put the wind up in. Put the wind up you too if you want to buy one. These plants are between three and 500 years old and they'll set you back 750 pounds a piece. But are they really suitable for English gardens? Yes, yes. I mean, I could grow nearly all these plants in my windswept garden in the East Midlands. So are these plants going to end up in an English garden? No, unfortunately, I'd like them for my garden, but they're all going to a palace garden, which I'm working on for a prince in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And will he plant them himself? Uh, he does have a little bit of help, I understand. He doesn't really have time for these little details. In the past, designer Julie Toll's wild gardens have caused some raised eyebrows, for example, when she introduced stinging nettles to Chelsea. Now she's become accepted into the mainstream, and Julie's become an expert in the art of making gardens look as though nature, and not a designer, has been at work. So have you ever stumbled across a forest glade as delightful as this one? The plants Julie's use for sponsors Pro Carton are a mixture of the native and the cultivated, and you'd be most unlikely to find such a wide range of habitats in so small a space. So what? That's what makes this a garden and not a forest. I have to say, I don't really understand this garden, Deborah. What's it all about? 
I think it's a typical English country garden, is it not? I think it's a typical Irish <laughs> country garden. Well, maybe. It's, I think it's a garden with a bit of passion in it. Uh, it's the idea of using different materials like these glass slabs as paving, which light up at night uh, when you stand on them. We have a glass brick wall with stainless steel, which curves at the back, and we have climbing say, plants. Yeah. It reminds me a bit of a gentle loop. Well, it, it does really, doesn't it? <laughs> it, it, it? Actually, the inspiration for it was from a nightclub in Dublin called The Pod, and uh, they have water running down full-length mirrors when you go into this, so that's where that came from. And influences should come from everywhere. So really, the best time to view this particular garden is at night? Yeah, well, during the day, it's, it's I hope, very 1930s, very elegant, very restrained. And then at night, it's full of passion with all these lights and all these weird shapes being thrown up. I love it at night. I better come back later. You better see it then. Yeah. John Plummer for the Daily Mirror believes that no matter how small your garden, it's possible to import that rather grand country house design idea of garden rooms. Now, it has to be said that some of the rooms are tiny, but what it gives adventurous gardeners is the opportunity to develop different styles and different colours in different rooms. But if you want a garden that even has the kitchen sink, you need Roger Platt's series of living rooms. Here, the bathroom, an old porcelain butler's sink used as a water feature. It's right next door to the dining room with a shady arbour under which you can sit and sip your pims of a summer's afternoon. And the bedroom? Well, it hasn't exactly got an interior sprung, but it's got a chamomile bed. Deliciously fragrant when you crush it and lay back on it. Now, if you're an old misery, you could argue that the gardens at Chelsea Flower Show just aren't real. Well, it's true. You could say they'd be extremely expensive to put on at home. Well, that's true as well. But ideas are free, and all you need to do is buy a packet of Iceland poppy seeds and grow these and you're a rich man. And so, to bed, to sleep, perchance to dream of garden. Alan, he'll never know what he missed. <laughs>